In 1945, some workers in Egypt accidentally dug into an early Christian tomb. Inside, they found a large jar containing 13 leather-bound manuscripts, which were composed of 48 separate works. Practically all of these works are Gnostic, meaning they teach salvation through mystical knowledge. And one of these manuscripts contains the Gospel of Thomas. In Gnosticism, people are believed to be souls in material bodies. Only through true knowledge can they ascend. And according to this religion, Jesus is the Redeemer who came to communicate that knowledge and liberate man. He communicated this knowledge to selected disciples, one of them being Thomas. In almost all spiritual paths or traditions that are followed, Eventually, that which is discovered leads to this same ascension. And if these teachings had been placed in the modern Bible, the message may possibly have been clearer and more focused on the power that is held within each person. The Gospel according to Thomas doesn't tell a story. It's a compilation of approximately 114 sayings attributed to Jesus. The opening words of the document read, these are the secret words which Jesus, the Living One, spoke, and Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And he said, Whosoever finds the interpretation of these sayings shall never taste death. Let not him who seeks desist until he finds. When he finds, he will be troubled. When he is troubled, he will marvel, and he will reign over the universe. The sayings themselves are not the secret. The secret lies in their interpretation. When you find the true answers, it will trouble you because it goes against most of what you've been taught. And when the truth of it sets in, it will marvel you. And then you will know your power, that you have supreme reign over your life and everything in it, that you truly can experience heaven on earth. The Gospel of Thomas has been eliminated from the Bible, and there are many explanations as to the reasoning. Some religious leaders express that if you read it and compare it to what you see in the New Testament, it's a very different kind of book, presenting a quite different Jesus. They claim that these particular teachings about Jesus mesh with certain philosophical principles that only grew in popularity, but that they aren't necessary to the work of the Bible. How many have heard of the lost gospel of Thomas? The lost gospel of Thomas. Some of you have heard of that text. Very, very powerful text. The lost gospel of Thomas is powerful because it is believed to be the actual words of Jesus as he was teaching those around him how to use the power of human emotion in his life. And if the indigenous people know it, and if the ancient people know it, why don't we know it? What happened to our knowledge? Well, this is a very good question. And the answer is this. In our Western tradition, and I'm, when I say Western, I'm assuming that we are of the Judeo-Christian tradition, is what I'm, I'm talking about here. There was a time when this field and the language of emotion was part of our tradition. It was in our texts. Until the fourth century, the year 325 AD. In the year 325, something happened. Our texts were edited, and we lost tremendous amounts of information. The Emperor Constantine in the early Christian church, with the early Christian Bible, had to make decisions. What information do we include? What information do we exclude? And what we know now is that f at least, at least 45 books were either completely taken away or tremendously edited 
into what we call today our Western biblical tradition. And when those edits were made, we lost the information that tells us everything is connected. We lost the information that tells us the language that speaks to this field. We know the information was lost because we are now recovering the information in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Nag Hammadi Library, in the Coptic texts. This is how we know this information was lost. When we find writings belonging to Jesus that are not recorded in our primary sources, but are consistent with the ones that are, we are inclined to believe that they do indeed come from him. However, when the sayings seem to be a bit inconsistent with other teachings, we are told they have been edited out due to validity, rather than the fact that they are the sacred truth intended to be passed into the hands of all people, but that have only been reserved for a few. Any spotlight on the belief that each person is filled with the same higher power as Jesus, rather than it being an outside force to be feared, would have changed everything we know about life and our entire history. Because we are each different does not make us separate. We are all a part of the same one consciousness, simply taking different forms. Here are some of the sayings of Jesus from the Gospel according to Thomas and their possible interpretations. Verse number three. If those who lead you say to you, See, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. This teaching refers to the consequences of believing that power is outside of the individual. If you believe that this ruling power belongs to someone or something else, then that thing will hold dominion over your life. However, when the realization is made of who we each truly are, the one consciousness that moves through everything, and that all power comes from within, we can live in an ascended and rich way. The kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. You literally manifest your outside circumstances from within. If you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. The belief that outside events and people have control over a person's life keeps them from living the richness that is rightfully theirs. They manifest as they believe. Verse 27 If you do not fast from the world, you will not find the Father's domain. If we do not turn away from the things that disturb us and believe in the power within to change all things, we will continue to experience that reality in our lives. Verse 50 If they say to you, Where did you come from? Say to them, We came from the light, the place where the light came into being on its own accord, and established itself, and became manifest through their image. If they say to you, Is it you? Say, we are its children. We are the elect of the living Father. If they ask you, What is the sign of your Father in you? Say to them, It is movement and repose. The word light is used to portray the origin of humans. The light is the consciousness of each person, manifested as a physical being. It is the all in all that exists as each individual. Consciousness lives through us as activity and awareness. Verse 77 Jesus said, It is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. From me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. 
Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. This explains that the one consciousness lives within everything. What lives in him also lives within all other things. Verse 113 His disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? Jesus said, It will not come by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying, Here it is, or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. We have always had the power within ourselves, but we have lost sight of it. It is not something that we have to wait to experience. This consciousness is already a part of all things, including each person. To unleash the force of the divine matrix in our lives, first, we have to understand how it works, and the science tells us how it works. Secondly, we must speak the language that the divine matrix recognizes, and science cannot tell us that. That comes from our past, from our culture, from our history, from those who have learned and used this language for thousands of years. So this is what we're doing right now. We're learning what did Jesus and what did the great masters say about this, this language. Because it's the same whether you're talking Buddhist or Hindu or Christian, pre-Christian traditions, they're all telling us that there is a field of energy and that we have the language to use that field. This is an actual page out of the Gospel of Thomas. So we know that this, this ancient gospel actually existed. And you can, uh, you can see some of the letters. These are Greek letters. You can actually read some of, if you know Greek, you can see some of the Greek letters right here. In the Gospel of Thomas, two very important keys. This was written uh, right around 300 uh, years after the time of Jesus. In this gospel, okay, so here, here's what we're doing. We've been in the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet, and they're telling us that we must, that feeling is the prayer, one. Two, that we must feel as if our prayers have already been answered. Okay, and now we're in an Egyptian monastery with the texts that used to be our tradition before they were edited, and we're going to look at the instructions that tell us how to do that. You okay if we do that? Is that good? Okay. Gospel of Thomas. If you have a copy of the Gospel of Thomas, this is verse 106, translated from the Nag Hammadi Library. And if you do not have a copy, it's in our books, uh, and you can, you can go to any library and pick this up. Verse 106. Look at what the lost Gospel of Thomas says. It says, When you make the two... Thought and emotion one. So the Gospel of Thomas is talking about thought and emotion. It's saying when you make your thought and your emotion one, look at what happens. You will say to the mountain, mountain move away and the mountain will move away. It's saying that when you can marry your thought and your emotion into one single potent force. That is when you have the power to speak to the world. Secondly, when you make the two one, what are they talking about? What are the two? Let's go back to our image. The two, thought and emotion. When the two become one in our hearts, we create the feelings in our bodies. When thought and emotion become one, and you'll see how to do that in just a minute. Let's go back to the Gospel of Thomas, another verse. Now this is verse 48. It says almost the same thing. This was so important that it was recorded at least three different times in the same Gospel. 
Look at what this says. If the two make peace with each other in this one house, when Jesus is talking about the house or the temple, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Precisely, you. You are the house. You are the temple. If the two make peace with each other in this house, if thought and emotion become one, if they make peace with each other in this house, look what happens. They will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away. He's telling us again, in a completely different verse, how powerful it is to marry thought and emotion. But they still haven't told us how. How do you do this? That's the next piece. In the early Christian Bible, your Bible today, there is a passage. How many have heard, ask and ye shall receive? Have you heard that before? Ask and ye shall receive. Have you heard that? I know people that ask and ask and ask and nothing happens. Because the asking is not done with the voice. The asking is not done, please, please, bring this to my world. That's not asking. To ask, we must speak to the field, to the divine matrix, in the language that the field recognizes. In a language that's meaningful, the field doesn't recognize our voice, it recognizes the power of our heart. Remember this morning, our heart, we have a feeling, creates electrical waves, magnetic waves. That's the language the field recognizes. So when you create the feeling in your heart as if your prayer is already answered, that creates the electrical and the magnetic waves that bring that answer to you. In the Bible that you have today, the King James Version, John 16, 23, 24, what you have is the condensed version. You have the edited version. The edited version looks like this. This is the edited version. Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Okay? Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Okay, this is the edited version. This is so amazing to me because they took out the two sentences that tell us how to ask. In the fourth century, when the edits happened, they took those two sentences out. Would you like to see those two original sentences? Okay, we'll go back into the original Aramaic and we'll look at a new translation. This is the original Aramaic. It begins, it looks very similar. So this is the retranslated version with the missing pieces. All things that you ask straightly, directly from inside my name, you will be given. It says, so far you've not done this because if we ask with our voice, we have not done this. Now here's the piece that was edited. Here is what was lost. Look at these two very powerful sentences. Ask without hidden motive and be surrounded by your answer. Be enveloped by what you desire that your gladness be full. Look at what it's saying. It's not saying to speak a word, it's saying to be surrounded, to feel as if. If you are surrounded, you are feeling as if your answer has already happened. Be enveloped. If you want the perfect relationship in your life, if you want the healing in the body of your loved ones, feel the feeling of what it is like as if that has already happened. Be enveloped by what you desire, because that is when your thought and your emotion become one. You think the thought of the healing in your loved ones, and you feel the love of that thought. They become one, 
And that is the language that this field recognizes. Does that make sense? Are you okay with that? You're going to see an example of this, another example here in just a moment. Ask without hidden motive. What does that mean? Hidden motive. Ask without judgment. This is precisely what the Buddhists are telling us. Ask without the judgment of the right or the wrong or the good or the bad. Ask without the ego. Ask from the heart. Is this meaningful to you? Is this helpful at all? Let me give you an example then. Because to be, if it says be surrounded, that means to feel as if. To feel as if. Now if that sounds too religious, because it's from the Bible, we smoked, spoke this morning uh, about Neville, uh, the, the philosopher Neville, early in the 20th century. His book, The Power of Awareness. Look at what he says, it's the same thing. Neville says, you must make your future dream a present fact. Now, by assuming the feeling of your wish fulfilled, to come from the place that it's already happened. Now, this is what those practitioners did with that cancerous tumor. I want to just elaborate on this a little bit. When those practitioners healed the woman with her tumor this morning, they did not judge the cancer as wrong or bad or right or good. There was no judgment. They accept that tumor as a possibility, one of many possibilities, because in the quantum world all things are possible. So they didn't say, bad cancer, you must go away or we're going to operate on you, or we're going to use radiation on you. They didn't do that. They accepted the cancer as it was without hidden motive, without judgment. And they said, now we're going to choose a new reality by feeling, assuming the feeling as if the woman is already healed. So what they did was they felt the feeling as if the woman was fully healed, fully enabled, fully capacitated, already happened. And the, the chant that they were using, wasa, wasa, loosely translates into the words already done, already done. And then when they got excited, they said, mate, 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 means now, now, now. Not a year from now, not a month from now, not five minutes from now. Now, in the quantum world, now. And her body responded. It must. Physical reality must respond to the language that it understands. So in the Buddhist traditions, they are telling us the quality of the feeling. And in the Judeo-Christian traditions, they are giving us the instructions to be surrounded, to be enveloped, how to create that feeling. And when you put those all together, it's something that happens in our hearts, not in our minds. Feeling as if the prayer is already answered with no judgment and no ego, and feeling from the result. Feeling from the result as if it's already happened. Are there any martial artists here in the room? Karate experts? I studied martial arts uh, when I was in my 20s and 30s, a little bit in my 40s and 50s. Have you seen martial artists when they demonstrate their focus by breaking a concrete block? Have you seen that? You've all seen that before, right? Okay, here's the secret. Here is the secret to breaking that block. When the martial artist is focused on that block, the very last thing that they are thinking is about their hand hitting the block. Because if they think about that, they know it will hurt. So they focus on what happens after their hand has passed through the block. 
as if it has already happened. They focus on a place below the block and feel the feeling as if their hand is already in that place. That is a metaphor, that is an equivalent for what we're doing with the power of emotion. Feeling as if the experience has already happened. The Gospel of Thomas represents our connection to consciousness and all that is. It is the knowledge that liberates man. If a person does not experience this higher consciousness, they believe themselves to be separate, alone, and simply a victim of circumstance. To break free from any manifested reality that does not serve what a person desires, the false image of the self must be replaced with the true knowledge of who and what we each are, and the power that we each possess.